I got a lot of books from China and that kind of inspired me with the dragons and all. But I didn't want my dragons to be mean looking. I wanted them to be carefree and they're dancing around in a circle. This is the piece with the dragons. And if you look at that piece, there's eight of them and they're all different. On November 8th, 2014, Philadelphia Center for Art and Wood honored the artist Ron Fleming for his considerable contributions to the center and his achievements as an artist. That afternoon, I was going to interview Ron at the center, but he was suffering from a severe attack of gout. Despite his intense pain, he welcomed me in his hotel room and told me about his life and work. I have never met a more gracious, humble, and talented man. He told me that he was born in Oklahoma City, but his parents soon moved deep into the country. Every weekend, this friend of mine would come over and we'd take off and go camping. Sometimes it would be real cold and we'd lay down in these tall grasses and all that was just blowing across the top of you and you got a lot of peace from it. I was a collector. Feathers and stones and anything we could find. I always tried to keep one piece every year in my own collection. I had done about four I think of pieces like this that are painted. I just decided I was going to do one more and keep it so I did and then when I called Albert, I said, I want to donate a piece of work to you all. What would you like to have? And he says, we want one of your painted pieces. <laughs> so I said, okay. Ron is now internationally renowned as a woodturner, carver, and sculptor. But before that, he had a long career as a commercial artist and illustrator. His love of painting goes way back. When I was young, like eight, nine, before we moved out in the country, my parents would uh, work jigsaw puzzles to pass time because back then we didn't have a TV, we didn't have air conditioning. I would take the lid of the box and my dad would get his shirts done and, and I'd take the cardboard out of them and I'd make a drawing of them and then I would paint in oils with it. And I learned a little bit about painting and, and it got me a job as an illustrator everything kind of blossomed from there. When I was, uh, I guess, about 14, my art teacher told me just go back in the back, play with the airbrush, because I can't teach it to you. I don't know how it works. You're just going to have to do what you want to do. So I did, and that's how I got into airbrush. I just started playing with the thing and learning how to use it. Back then, there wasn't anything made for a left-handed person. So I had to kind of start out being ambidextrous to use the airbrush in my right hand because they didn't make left hand ones then. I went to college there. I studied engineering and I came out as an engineer. I was designing bridges and drawing up the plans and it got to be just math, math, math. <laughs> and I wanted to be an illustrator. My mother gave me more support and my grandfather on her side really gave me support. At one point, Ron got a job doing manuals for Douglas Aircraft. My boss called me in one day. They were kind of monitoring me to see how much I had progressed as an artist. And my boss said, Ron's a really good worker, but he'll never make a commercial artist. And I stood up and said, George, if that's the way you feel, I'll see you later. Send me my check. I had a guy from New York call me and wanting to rep me. So I got a rep in New York and I started my own business after the guy told me I wasn't going to make it as a commercial artist. I uh, wished he was still alive because I'd like to show him up. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be that way, but I had 14 other artists working for me. One was a cartoonist, one was good at drawing people because we'd do a lot of corporate annual reports and whatnot, and they didn't want to use photographs. And I did that for 
14 years. I can't tell you whether it was good or bad because they kept me so busy. I had eight months that I didn't have a day off. And my wife was kind of getting a little upset about the hours I was working. And I thought I would never give up the airbrush. But when the computer came out, that was what it was all about. And I'd go around to the agencies. They didn't want to talk to an old guy like me. They were all young kids. And they didn't know anything about the airbrush. And they could look at my portfolio and tell me it was great. But I never got any work out of it. And that's kind of when I retired because I'd taken up wood carving to kind of tone me down from all the stress that I was getting from New York. I could go down there when I first turned, seven o'clock in the morning, and I'd start feeling, man, I'm getting tired and hungry. I'd go upstairs and it's five o'clock. The time just went by. It's so mesmerizing that uh, it, it makes you forget all of the bad things in life. That's where I started. <laughs> it was pretty crude. I didn't know how to turn. I didn't know nothing. Those pieces showed me where I came from. Wood turning, I started about 1980, and then I came across a book with a bunch of master wood turners in it. And that gave me some encouragement. You know, there's the guys like Ellsworth and Giles Gilson. And there were a bunch of them that were an influence on me as far as how to turn a piece. I don't think I'd have ever made it if I hadn't gone to that one conference. I think that was about 85. It was their first ITOS. I helped Albert put together some brochures for it. And I got there, I just saw all this beautiful work. And I thought, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> Were you surprised when your woodworking ended up being as successful as it is? I've had a lot of collectors collect my wood, and it's just been an amazing journey. I feel like I've accomplished more in the wood field than I ever did in the airbrush field, because there I was having to satisfy them, and my wood, I'm satisfying myself. past almost 30 years, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of, to have Ron Fleming as a friend, a person on whom you could count to be there if and when you needed him. Tonight's gathering celebrates him as a person as well as a consummate professional, an artist in the field of turning and sculpting. The latter part is pretty obvious when you take a look over here and see the scope of the work that he has produced. What aren't as obvious are Ron's genuine humility, generosity, and thoughtfulness during times when he had some personal challenges with family and health. When the center's initial board of trustees was formed about 26 years ago, wood artists were struggling for recognition. Ron, as a board member, as you've heard Albert say, and an officer, came from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Philadelphia at his own expense and was here for all of our quarterly meetings. His style was to listen carefully to what others had to say and only speak when he could build on their thoughts or he could add something that was a new idea. Consequently, we all listened and we all benefited from his leadership. And I have had the privilege to see my friend's unique work in my home for many years. It always brings a smile, and I thank you, Ron Fleming. Ron's love of nature is quite evident in his work. Trips to Africa have given him lots of inspiration. The fern pieces I've got in there, like the platter, we were in Botswana, South Africa. We were going down the river in these little shallow canoes through the hippo trails. And I saw these beautiful little ferns, and I just took pictures of them, and I got back home. I, played with that a little bit and made a very simpler version of it or a stylized version. I, I like Art Deco and I feel like my work kind of shows that. We got a lot of Art Deco in Tulsa, so it's uh, been a pretty good inspiration. And this was a piece of pink ivory that I got. I made contact with a guy that used to live in South Africa. He got the right from the 
government to cut this for them. It's a very, very hard, exotic wood, hard as a brick. I mean, it's like carbon on a brick, but it's so beautiful. My wife being a gardener, she was always doing something. These leaves were interpreted from the orchids that she was raising. And you can see the weaving of the wood. I wish I had a lot more of it. This piece I carved out of walnut and I carved another one and set it down around a bowl. And the guy bought both of them so I got left with this one. <laughs> I don't take them literally, I just try to make them come up out of the bowl and spill on the ground. And that's what touches, the bowl doesn't touch the ground. And I think that's uh, coming from when I was working as an engineer at the bridge department. I did an awful lot of work for Phillips Petroleum Company. They were about 50 miles north of where I live. So going up there, it's just prairie. And in fact, there's part of it that's called tall grass prairie. And these scissor tails would set up there on those power lines, and they'd see a bug and they'd just dive down and get the bug and go back and set it on. That's where I got this idea of these birds swirling around. Here's a photograph of a scissor tailed flycatcher. Ron's ability to find the abstract essence of a subject is key to his art. And this one is sycamore, and it's one of my old styles. The leaves are dull, and the body of it is done in clear lacquer. These I just made up. A lot of people that are carving leaves today, they're getting real literal with it. I'm trying to take what I see and, and do my own interpretation of it. I think that's what most artists have trouble doing. There were a lot of sunflowers. I mean, just as far as you could see, sunflowers. So that's what this interpretation is. It's a sunflower, along with these other leaves kind of blending in. And when I got through with it, you could look through these holes and it looked like a solar eclipse. And that's why I titled it Eclipse. And that one's made out of coca ball, which is a rare wood too. But This piece, you can really see the quilting in it. And I like to use contrast. And if you look at that picture, from here up it's shiny. From here down it's, it's real dull. It's because I sandblasted this part of it and just put an oil on it. And this has got lacquer on it. I try to work with wood that has come down from the PSO cutting the tree limbs and cutting them up. And making firewood out of them and I always had people on the lookout for trees like that and uh, some of my favorite local trees was hackberry and sycamore and I got a lot of uh, redwood lace burl those pieces in the show that are made out of redwood are probably over a thousand years old the tree was cut in 1908 it was six foot in diameter and it sat there for all these years and the forest fires would burn the top of it. And this guy goes in there with a bulldozer and brings up that wood. He didn't know what he had. Another friend of mine there in town hooked a trailer on the back of the truck. Met him in Oklahoma City and he, we bought this great big old cube of redwood. And it was all just lace all the way through it. And if you look at those pieces, you can see the stripes in it. This piece that they used on the cover was a great big piece of maple. And I had to go up inside there while it was turning, and I just ended up with a real rough block. So I had to come back and carve to that natural surface. I wanted that to be a dull and a natural thing, and this was real shiny. When I turned this piece, because it was so top heavy, I left a little weight in the bottom of it, and up underneath here, it's about the thickness of a dime. 
I mean, you, there's a, a hole there, and that's where I thought, oh man, I went through it. <laughs> a lot of times this happens, as it'll tell me its name. And this is one it did because this little design right here just spiraled out like a jewel. I just called it Jewel of the Nile. Though wood has been his primary medium, Ron has been venturing into other media as well. Hugh McKay called me one day and said, you know, your work would look good in glass. So I sent him this piece, and there's a glass piece that he made. I had a gallery up in Connecticut come by at a booth one time and say, I'd like to rep you. And this was Mike Mendelson. He was the first guy that owned a gallery that I felt I could trust. He repped me about three years, and uh, my wife went with me everywhere I went. And then one day she comes to me and says, I want to learn how to carve. Oh, God, the first pieces she did were just mind-boggling. And we'd send them to Mike, and we did so much work for him but I couldn't even tell you how many pieces it was. His health went bad on him and he closed his gallery. It was like getting fired. He, he was a super nice guy, I tell you. Ron, you're 77, correct? Right. And you've had many losses in your life. How do you keep going? What makes you want to get up in the morning? Well, that's, that's a pretty intense question, but Patty passed away in uh, 03. Losing her and her inspirations that she would give me, it took me a while. I didn't, I didn't even come to any of these club groupings and so forth, workshops and whatnot, for almost 10 years. And I, I just, one day I got up and I said, look, you can't just sit around here. You, you need to get back to work. And that's about the time Albert called and wanted me to do a show up here to raise money. And I said, boy, I'd love to do that because I'm tripping over all of it. But that, that first 10 years when she was gone, it, it was hard on me. And I still have a hard time thinking because she's always in here. <laughs> I've got four kids, one stepdaughter. My daughter's an artist. Her son, which is my grandson, is one whale of an artist. When you step away and look back at yourself and see all the different stages you went through, and especially in the wood, if you look at my work, it changes constantly. I'll do four or five pieces in a series, and then I'll come back and do another series, and I get these ideas, I don't know. Sometimes I just get them when I'm asleep. Sometimes when I'm walking up to the mailbox, I hope to get back to it when I get home, because I want to get back to work. I got ideas coming out the kazoos right now. <laughs> 21 years ago, Ron designed our logo for our first World Turning Conference. So, in recognition of that, Here's a hat <laughs> from that time period. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And if someone else likes it and it touches them like it touches me, that's the battle. That's over. just makes you feel so good. <laughs>